So hello everyone and welcome to the fifth session of the Decentering Whiteness discussion series. Um, today's topic is on um, the climate of history in a planetary age. And we're very fortunate to have with us um, our facilitator, facilitator uh, Jennifer. And just a quick intro, um, George and Andrew are the organizers of this particular um, workshop series. They are um, Vancouver School Board employees. Um, both are white male settlers who are interested in looking at theatrical and organizational aspects to anti-racist work with the hopes of identifying their own racist practices, working towards unlearning its practices and contributing to building an anti-racist learning environment for their colleagues and students. Um, George and Andrew both work together at McGee Secondary. Um, George is a counselor and a member of the Vancouver Secondary Teachers Association. And Andrew is the principal of the school and current chair of the Vancouver Association of Secondary School Administrators. Um, lastly, uh, just to let everyone know, um, UBC um, is on the uh, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And now I'm going to um, pass on to Andrew. Thanks so much, Calvin. Uh, and thanks uh, people who've carved out some time from your busy schedules uh, to join us. Um, and a couple of the folks, colleagues who are repeat, um, who are coming back a second time or third time. Um, so you know a little bit about the structure of our program and what we're trying to do. Um, and as part of that, the complexity of, of decentering our mind frameworks and the way we think and the way we structure schools and education and, um, and what we do, um, a huge part of that is recognizing the ancestral territories of the Musqueam Nation on which McGee, our school, the school is located, um, and as you recognize the land that you're on. Um, because for me and for George, I think that's a fundamental recognition as the decentering away from the individualist paradigms um, of the Enlightenment and, and much of my Eurocentric thinking uh, and decentering that towards a, a relationally based um, paradigm and process and practice. Uh, and it's something that we value very much within our school and we're trying it every day and with all those frustrations, right, George? Um, then um, we also have, are very privileged to have Jennifer Reddy, who's joining us, um, and Jennifer has wears many hats, and one of them is a trustee in the school board. And um, but in addition to that, Jennifer uh, has formed a really interesting, important and. Uh, NGO and non-governmental organization that works with new immigrant youth. Um, and Jennifer, perhaps at a point, if you can speak a little bit about that organization. Um, and um, also Jennifer is works for the city of Vancouver and the town planning, um, social planning department, um, helping to uh, diversify um, and um, deepen the city's understanding of race, racism, and its um, structural effects. And again, uh, Jennifer, I think it'd be very awesome if you have some thoughts on how that works from and how we can do that together um, as city and, and schools um, and those intersections. Uh, Alpha is, uh, was a facilitator in our first session. Um, and Alpha, if you don't mind any time, just climb in as well, right, brother? Um, so, um, if by way, that's a little bit of the introduction. Um, as you can see on the slide, the, uh, the title Intersections Global, we're starting, George and I, we're starting to try to move um, from the kind of groundwork principles um, and towards how, what are the intersections and how do we move towards anti racist um, structures um, and action within our schools and within our communities? Um, and a part of that I, came to me through Chakraborty's work, um, and it's summarized there in that, that phrase at the bottom, global to planetary, um, and then to the local. And really, uh, Jennifer's work is very much, so much within the local. George, all of our work is very locally based. Chakraborty pushes and makes the argument that we need, there's a shift from global to planetary and understandings. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, later on. 
Um, and then in terms of just the structure and some of the background for today, I think you all know some of the readings, which if you've been able to do, um, or if you're going to hold them over for summer, that's all fantastic. Um, the the music, the film, Amantla, we might talk, we'll talk about that in, in after five, I think a little bit as part of decentering. And then if you do come across Billy Ray Belcourt's work, uh, his poetry and some of his novel writing, uh, he's off BBC. Um, yeah, that's it's it's also speaks for itself. He's First Nations uh, transgender um, person, um, and we'll perhaps speak a little bit more depending on our time. Um, but if we don't mind at this point bringing Jen into the conversation, um, and Jennifer, your mic is off, and I'm just if we can just check in with you for a little bit. Um, Jen, part of the structure of, of and part of our belief is, is really understanding our ancestry and how our ancestry shapes our practice uh, and shapes who we then work with and how in terms of relationship building. Um, and the Western paradigm, the um, Enlightenment paradigm, focuses on, on us as individuals. Um, and part of decentering whiteness is decentering that individualism. And could you tell us a little about about your ancestry and how you came to be um, at this place with working with the colleagues that, that you do. Um, your grandparents, you're some inspiring people in your, in your life and your family and your background. Do you have any brothers and sisters? Yeah, I love it. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, That's George. Right. Um, it's just wonderful. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, 100%. Okay, thanks. And just let me know if there's any issues there. But I'm just like really glad that you all have this space. And thank you so much for taking time to invite me to it. Um, I hope that what I can share is like more to spur discussion. I certainly, um, I don't think I have as much experience as anyone on this call. And I sort of am learning as I go. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and uh, I'm joining you from unceded territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and uh, being born and raised in Canada as a part of an immigrant family, there's so much to be um, learned outside of the Canadian citizenship system um, about our histories and about what it is that we need to take responsibility for. So, um, a lot of my learning in my adult life uh, in Canada has been about unceded land and being born and raised in British Columbia and recognizing that all of this land is unceded um, has really changed the perspective that I have of myself uh, in terms of my responsibility um, and work in public education, in the community, um, my own connection to intergenerational wealth and redistribution. So I'm constantly trying to challenge um, the norms that I've been taught, but also the ones that I'm trying to um, undo. Um, so a little bit of that is like recognizing the defaults of like worldviews and the way I think, or the values that I hold, but also the detours that can sometimes distract me from my own values that I've learned from my community. So um, my family uh, immigrated to Canada in the 70s. We are a long line of indentured laborers. So um, uh, intergenerationally, um, we uh, don't really know where our ancestors are from. We know that we have roots in India, um, but we don't really know where. And uh, my family was settled in Fiji as children, uh, children laborers. Um, and being indentured has brought a lot of advantages to our family. And I say that um, with hesitation because we benefit so much from colonization um, by participating in it. Um, and so when I um, decided to take on some of the work that I do, um, I recognize that there's a lot of reward in assimilation, and that is something that intergenerationally I've learned. Um, but I'm also trying to recognize the power that I have to not only name that and the rewards we get from participating in colonialism, but um, reframe um, how I use some of the power and privilege that I do have. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess I would say in terms of sort of who I am and how I show up to spaces is 
imagining that my ancestors are with me um, in all the actions that I'm taking and the, the seats that I'm, I'm taking up space in um, and recognizing that so many of them fought for labor rights. Um, being indentured means that you're really at the mercy of a system of bonded labor. And so you, what I've learned from my mom and my father is that you don't really have rights to the labor that you have or the land that you um, work. Um, and that makes the reward of your work very small. So your ability to move up, to gain education, to gain literacy is like significantly hampered because of the system of indentured labor, which is why they um, left Fiji um, because of the lack of land tenure and the ability to move ahead. So coming to Canada, um, still partaking in the colonial system, but being British subjects, uh, gave them access to different kinds of power, political power and economic power that they didn't previously have. So that's how I came to be here. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to listening and re-listening to the recording of this, because what you're saying there is in incredibly rich and mind-blowing um, for myself as a white South African growing up um, as a South African settler. Uh, in Durban, which was um, a tropical city uh, surrounded by sugarcane plantations uh, and indentured labor came to South Africa in the turn of the previous century. Um, and along with that, one of the people who, who journeyed to South Africa was Mohamdas Gandhi. And he started just outside Durban, uh, his Satyagraha movement as a lawyer. Um, and, and my observation of the indentured labor as a white racist settler um, and the learning that that was the first political sensitization that I got as a as a whatever 11 12 year old when we drive up the coast and look at the sugarcane fields and see um, indentured labor from India second and third and fourth generation and we drive past the um, compounds for Indian uh, labor and then how that was worked within the racist structure of South Africa um, by the South African government was one of the first political moments. And now here you are 40 years later and you're talking about your experiences in injured labor from the first person perspective. Um, and I'm thinking about Alpha who we've also had conversations with about his path to Canada. Um, and as, as some of the benefits from colonization by participating and the rewards to assimilation, that, that you referred to. Um, and that's a conversation which is occurring, I think, in many different parts of the world. Um, and just been following in the Manchester Guardian, uh, a very a fascinating conversation um, about how the Guardian newspaper benefited from slavery and colonization and the cities of Manchester and the, and the industrial cities and how to decenter those the, the benefits and the, the riches that have been accrued. One of the ways is through the policy of reparations and the payment of reparations. And uh, it's come up also within South Africa, how, how can reparations be made and how can we atone financially and for, for some of this? And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a debate I have here at school with myself when I look out at the school and we have a house post carving program with the Masquerum Nation and two Masquerum carvers. And it's very important. George is overseeing that and supervising. It's a fundamentally important aspect to a lot of resurgence work, which we're trying to do um, and support here in, in, at McGee. Um, so, and I know reparations has been very much within a financial context and discussion around uh, the repayment of debt or, or um, abolishment of debt and debt from other countries. And I'm just being, I'm thinking about spiritual reparations and uh, whether there's any aspect to reparations um, and the intergenerational wealth and redistribution. Um, can there be any, do you, would you have any thoughts just off the cuff um, around that and, and, and the spiritual dimension to that? And could that be uh, a component to that making right um, and acknowledging what's occurred? Perhaps the house post is seen in that sense. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that or to put you on the spot? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, well, for one, I guess like this space that you all have, is like a way to pause the harm for a moment 
and reframe what it is we're doing, why and who we're centering in our work. Um, so if we if we are talking about like reparations, um, who are we prioritizing? And so I can pull on some of the work we're doing in the context of social policy at the city and you know, what role does municipal government have in spiritual reparations? And um, what I'm finding is that actually to get to what the reparational measures are, we have to be able to tell the truth about what happened. And there's not a lot of appetite. It's coming, but there's not a lot of public appetite for truth telling and the public education that's needed to recognize all of our complicity um, in harms within communities, lateral violence, um, and racist decision-making and policies. So um, as an example, I can say that we're focusing on certain communities that have not been completely decimated. So these are communities that still have survivors that have intergenerational knowledge about what happened. And there are conversations now about addressing the loss of intergenerational wealth through housing uh, and lack of housing ownership, lack of access to land, but also employment opportunities. But for us to even have a conversation about what shape or look and feel that might have, we first need to be able to truth tell and create a lot of space to hear what the impacts are. And that also means that a lot of our policies or things that were said weren't always explicitly racist or explicitly discriminatory, but their impacts had race implications and discriminatory impacts. So I'm finding that we need quite a bit more time and space to truth tell, to pause, to hear what the impacts have been intergenerationally, and this is just from survivors. So those that have been completely erased and displaced, their voices aren't even represented in the room, but arguably the impacts are there. So I feel like the spiritual piece comes out a lot in that process of listening together to the truths. So I'm not sure if that's helpful, but I've noticed that there needs to be a bit of a culture shift and a political will to listen to the impacts and just allow that to sit in and of itself before we get to what the solutions for reparational measures might look like. Um, and I'm finding in general, it's helping the mechanisms for reparations settle a little bit more smoothly, that it isn't sort of, oh, now what does this community want? It's more of like, wow, we were all partaking in this and we don't want to approach reparations at the expense of, say, other groups. Yeah, and and as you're talking and and referring and reflecting on your position within uh, the city as a as a social planner in the city, and then I'm thinking um, of the clearing of the Hastings Street strip, and how that was done and how that was affected, uh, and I had a conversation with Vince Tower from Vandu, who um, spoke with us uh, in this decentering group um, two or three sessions ago. Um, and so I reached out to Vince um, on behalf of Vasa um, and, and was asking him if there's anything we can do around support and understanding and understanding the complexity of that situation, but also understanding the, the um, unacceptable way in which it was dealt with and that there's no debating and no doubt that the people in, on the street down in the downtown, according to Vince, need housing and need programs and need support. That's given and that First Nations and women are particularly vulnerable down there in that situation. is That's not part of the debate here. But is that, the problem is how it was dealt with. And that clearing reminded me so much of, of clearings of, of informal settlements in South Africa during the racist era, um, and how the police would move in with the bulldozers and the garbage trucks um, and the weapons and the dogs um, and so I was I had flashbacks about that and I'm thinking this is not what I came to Canada to see um, so yeah we need more discussion um, and we need that spiritual cleansing for um, and we need to listen um, but then I think we also need to have that courage to to bear witness 
um, to what's unacceptable in a process, and then to be able to speak out um, as witnesses that that process was not correct um, and call call the mayor to account um, for that and and respectfully and say and you know dude that's not the way we do things. Um, from your any any thoughts there around yeah. if, how do you uh, how, how did you guys feel when in, within the city you guys must have been blindsided as well right because that throws you back by by years all the relationship yeah. building that you guys have been doing yeah and i think um a couple of thoughts just come to my mind and i'd love to i mean i don't know if folks like put comments in the chat or anything but feel free to to share your reflections and experiences. Um, one of the pieces of, um, or principles, I would say, of the approach to cultural redress that I've been trying to unpack and explore within like the municipal context is that if we're not learning from the cultural redress process, so if we're taking in these truths, but we're not changing the way we're making decisions or changing the bylaws or changing the policies to be anti-racist, then we will see the replication and the sort of perpetual apologies, um, perpetual cultural redress taking place. Um, mm. And unfortunately, I would say that is still very much the pattern. We are in a bit of a perpetual apology state, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I, I do think that like there's a role for uh, political will to take the lessons that we're learning and apply them in anti-racist ways. Um, there's many bylaws and policies that continue to be used as if they're neutral. And I think like that perception of neutrality of some of the tools that we do have available is where you see that embedded racist impact um, and discriminatory impact. So a tool like rezoning, uh, zoning a neighborhood, uh, making a plan, making a school-based policy, um, engaging with children and youth, if we're not considering it from an anti-racist point of view or how we might be committing anti-Black racism or anti-Indigenous racism in the policy design or implementation or evaluation, um, then we risk repeating the same mistakes. So. Mm -hmm. It's not a small undertaking, but I think um, we have a lot of lessons shared from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, specifically about this location. So when we talk about the downtown east side and we're talking about um, houselessness and gender-based violence, um, there have already been so many calls to action about um, accountability um, through police, through um, the justice system. So I think like when we look at like the Office of the Police Complaint Commissioner, there are also many calls to justice that relate to following up on what those um, calls to justice have been. So mm -hmm. I would definitely myself be looking to see if I'm working on addressing anti-Black racism on any level, I would wanna make sure that I align with the calls to justice from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry to say, hey, do we have some shared needs on housing that need to be addressed, um, but not looking at one community in isolation or at the expense of another community's needs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, just one part that you refer to there, the perception of neutra neut neutrality and the, the assumptions of neutrality. That whole notion, that whole discussion around neutrality uh, and professionalism is so much within the Eurocentric rationalist perspective. And it's so much seeped within the evolution of um, Eurocentric discourses. And that when we talk about decentering whiteness, I, I would certainly think that, and we wonder, well, what can I do? Well, one is to, as we do when we locate ourselves as people, is that's, that's part of recognizing that we're not neutral, but we are located in a place and a time and a headspace. Uh, and the policy discourse. And so um, I think that, that that's a key aspect, I think, or a part, a piece, one of the pieces, which when it comes to, to decentering whiteness. There was another thought that, that as we were talking earlier on, um, I, I was reflecting also on um, our first session or the second session where we looked at um, the book, Exterminate the Brutes. 
Um, and we encourage folks to watch the, the video version, the film version of that. In the film version, there's a scene in there where it, it looks at Antwerp, the city of Antwerp, and, and the role of Antwerp in colonization uh, and Zaire and the Zion rubber trade and how Antwerp benefited, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, if it's, um, and then the name of Antwerp came from um, an aspect of racist practice in Zaire. Um, and which was to to cut um, people's hands off, slaves and and indigenous African Zairians' hands off, and that's part of the name Antwerp, um, wiping out the hand, Dutch and, and Afrikaans for that, and all over Ant, uh, Antwerp there are these symbols of the hand, and and it's oh I travel to Europe and I wander around those places and this is lovely, this is beautiful, but. There's the symbolism, which we don't recognize, and we don't recognize the placement and the pain and what happened in those situations. And I'm looking at Vancouver's logo. Part of this came from the Guardian articles on, on Manchester and the Manchester soccer teams and their logo of the ships. And they're these three little ships on, on their logo. And those are ships which benefited from slavery. Coming back to your initial point, benefited from colonization by participation. Um, and their logo, it's still celebrating um, the, the unequal terms of trade, which we, we see in the world today, um, and how these cities are based on that. And I'm thinking of our own logo here at McGee. Um, I'm thinking of uh, um, the name of our school. I'm thinking of the name of our city, of the logo of our city, uh, the design of that, and how that subconsciously and consciously reinforces uh, dispossession, uh, reinforces marginalization. Um, and that comes back to, you know, George's vision and the, the need to put a, a house post, have a house post here as a public statement um, of our of our role and, and responsibilities. I think your role within the VSB as well um, in, and the, the uh, house posts in front of the VSB. I think those are very important symbolic markers which indicate that we are trying. And do you have any 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 thoughts to that? Yeah, I, I think like uh, what you mentioned about the house post at your school is really interesting. And it's so wonderful for these things to come out of relationships. Um, mm -hmm. I think so much of what we see in the commemoration realm, and this mm -hmm. shows, shows up in cultural redress as well, mm -hmm. um, is quite a bit dictated by transactional or performative like yeah. plaques yeah. Um, and maybe there's no learning involved in it or or there was a ceremony that took place and then afterwards there isn't a mm -hmm. component of ongoing public education mm -hmm. um, and so something we're grappling with is what is commemorative um, who gets to decide what commemoration is and is there a way to have living commemorative pieces that continue to educate the public otherwise sort of does that limit our ability to use that piece for cultural redress uh, measures and to like understand more about each other and like was there a time when house posts were erased um, for example and, and now like what is symbolic about being able to see this on a public education ground um, and the relationships between public education and indigenous peoples of these lands. So I really um, appreciate what you said about it coming from your relationships with Musqueam Nation. I think that's the key in this work and the risk of not doing it based on relationships and instead making it transactional um, mean that the distrust would actually- Increase. It would increase and we can no longer count on communities to come to us when there's problems, to come to us when there's good opportunities. So it actually shuts down all the potential communication, the good and the bad. Um, and so that's where I also feel like there's so much um, desire to want to protect the system. <laughs> um, and we find this in our work a lot. Like when I walk into my work uh, in the city context, I have to own everything that the city's done. And that's mm -hmm. not on me personally. But that is something I have to recognize as part of my relationship and people's experience with the city. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily with me, but I need to remember that it isn't personal um, and that I need to come back to these communities with yes. Like my answer to their inquiries needs to be yes. Um, and if I can't do that, I think I need to be able to 
ask myself, well, why am I the person doing this work? And if I keep coming back with no's to these communities, then am I the right person for this work? So I think there's sort of, yeah, there's like systems protection taking place and work that needs to happen on a personal level because we do make up the system. We own mm -hmm. the good and the bad. So mm -hmm. yeah, it just reminds me so much of the importance of like being in relation in order to come up with what these symbolic and real measures are going to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that your your comment living living commemorative aspects versus transactional. Going back to decentering whiteness, within that Eurocentric paradigm which I grew up in, it was all transactional. The, that's what was valued. The transactional element was valued. That's the key thing. What's in it for me, and then what's in it for you? Whereas, um, if we can really move beyond that understanding, we are really involving living commemoration as an ongoing practice of witnessing and as a way of building memorials we don't need those memorials when we are living in a just society and a just community and so i think from what i'm taking away right now and george is my witness and alpha works a lot in mcgee is how important for us to have a daily practice of living commemoration um, as living anti-racism in our school as part of what comes out of the beingness of this school. Um, and, and then we don't need to have all the other um, show pieces um, because it's obvious. Um, then uh, Alpha, George, any thoughts around, around the conversation? And then of course, um, any, any of our colleagues who've joined us, uh, Roberta, Heather, Elizabeth, Marilia, um, colleagues, any thoughts so far? Any questions to Jennifer while we have Jen here? Um, your reflections so far? Alpha, go. Yes, um, the word relationship and the power of that word is, is very crucial. And uh, because it allows us to participate. So I hear that as Jennifer is speaking, and it's, it's, uh, it's always encouraging because, it, you know, something that we've spoken of in, in different terms about people coming to the table and working together. Another power word you used was coming to the table, almost something similar that you said, yes, coming with yes to the, you know, to that conversation. That's powerful because, um, because it says, it, it talks about, you know, very much um, hearted interest in how the community is doing and that's incredible and it talks about how how can i how can i help and how can i be of service and another the word participatory you know you come in to participate because of the yes that you have and the relationship is very powerful and um as i listen to that i'm pretty i'm very much moved by that because it's, it's foundational to, you know, for me, it's very foundational if any change is going to be made. Mm -hmm. That's all I got to say. Um, I don't know, if, can I add something more? Yeah, honey. Yeah, thanks Alpha. I really appreciate like your reflection back and um, it's been a lot of work that we're doing with our colleagues too because we don't come trained in our fields or necessarily our social locations to recognize how often we say no <laughs> on behalf of the institutions without figuring out a way to say yes. And uh, we've had a facilitator work with us in the city context. Her name's Jada Gabriel Pape, um, who I'm not sure if folks here have worked with her, but being an external consultant and inviting us to ask ourselves, why us in this work? And how can we say yes? has been pretty transformative because sometimes we have colleagues in engineering, planning, uh, social policy who are like, oh, it's just, you know, our field is like this checklist or that uh, instrument or that tool um, mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily implicate yourself in it. So I think it was really good because we're just recognizing like our training that we got in order to get the jobs that we have is not sufficient to do the transformative work that's necessary in the system. Um, and so that's been really cool and like such an honor to be able to work with folks like her who push us like beyond our sort of trained boundaries or our job descriptions to think a lot deeper about the impact that we could have um, and we could make. So 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate your question. I think Jen Jennifer, that's such a good point. It's um, a lot of the important things we didn't learn formally, and we need to to have the, those skills to move forward and do the right things. And one thing working very closely with Andrew and Alpha over the past several years is that they have those skills and they're so sincere. They're not in it for personal gain. They're not in it to um, advance somebody's agenda. They're in it to do the right thing. And, and they use those wonderful skills they have. And they also help develop those skills in other people, which I deeply appreciate and watch them do that. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, thank you for bringing that up because I, I, I did at the moment, I didn't even think of saying it. And as soon as you said it, it was like, of course, that's that piece is a game changer. It's interesting. I'm just being struck by, um, I just had a flashback to reading uh, and then trying to apply within in South Africa during some of the negotiations that we were getting up to. Uh, I was involved in some of the local government negotiations in a, in a town called Ladysmith, which is extremely conservative Midlands, Heartland area. And one of the books we read was a book called Getting to Yes. And I think it was Lash and Uri or somebody like that. And But either way, it was called Getting to Yes. Uh, and uh, it was very useful in terms of negotiating strategy from I was representing the ANC, the African National Congress, against these outgoing white guys in the local government and the local municipality um, and how we would use just some of the ideas and strategies there to build a, a anti-racist division within the, the, the town, the little town of Ladysmith. Um, but yeah, it's just coming back to me how how that the strategy and the struggle of getting to yes, um, and how you know Jennifer you just mentioned the engineers and the different groups within the city, uh, and how to bring these very different worldviews and very different ways of constructing the world um, in into an understanding of decentering these entrenched paradigms of rationality. Uh, which makes sense to to engineers that that's how you do things, uh, but that could be part of the problematic practice, and and so there is no doubt that there are aspects within our profession as educators, George and I and Alpha, um, that there's some of that is very important to do, and but some of it 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 has makes no sense, um, and at least education is not is a is a slightly more open ended field, and and our job is to go along and explode people's minds. Um, but so often we, we aren't exploding our own mind. And I think that's why George and I wanted to do this because we recognize that, that we have to. Um, any, any of our participants, please go ahead. Uh, George, I'm, I'm not uh, watching the comments and anything like that. Are there any other hands up out there? We're all good. We're all good right now, but please, for everybody, feel free. This is, um, and we're, of course, no pressure, but please feel free. We, we value different perspectives because um, that's how we're going to grow and move on. So, but if you're not feeling comfortable doing it, just that, don't feel pressured, but we really value everybody's input. Thanks. Thanks, George. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Alpha. Um, I'm just just going to move it slightly on. Um, if folks were able to read Chakrabarti, please correct me if I'm misinterpreting his, his arguments and his work. Um, but just a very quick summary. What, what we've been looking at, I think, much of the conversation, all the conversation that we've been having so far today was really very much on the local issues. Um, and it's fascinating and exciting, and and that's where we're located. That's that's how that, that's all, that's where it needs to be. Um, playing it back to Chakrabarti, uh, he his he made his argument. He first made his argument in two thousand four in an art, article called Four Theses of the Anthropocene, and then he he deepened and clarified it in a couple of publications and some really interesting debates with colleagues who spoke back to the four theses of the Anthropocene. Uh, and then with this 2001 book, um, The Climate of History in the Planetary Age. Um, and it's from that that I took the title of, of our session today. Um, and very briefly, in a sentence, um, Dipesh argues that um, 
we need to recognize uh, that people are a geological force. Uh, and because of that, we need to reconfigure our notions of human agency and responsibility. So what's new about this epoch of time, and there are different ways of dating it, and there's debates around that, and there's section in that in the book um, about when, when is the start and, and what's, how's it going to end. Um, but regardless of when we are dating it from, um, human beings now are undeniably a geological force. And that's what's new in the past 100, 150, 25, whatever years you want to talk about it. And that has a significant impact, as we can see, on the environment um, and, and, um, and climate justice, climate change. Um, throughout the book, if you have an opportunity to read it, what, what um, our, our whole history, much of the Eurocentric paradigm, many of the other great philosophies of the world, religious, etc., and other, um, have prioritized global histories. And what Depeche is saying now is that as a geological force, we have to shift to a planetary understanding and the implications of human beings as a planetary force. Uh, globally, um, white folks moved out of Europe, we settled, we exploited, we pillaged, we raped, we, we brutalized, we did our thing. Um, and those were global forces um, and globalization as a force. Um, but now we are in a planetary force as a species, as a human species. And that fundamentally decenters humanity from our individual relationships, from our nationalist base relationships to our global humanity. Uh, and what, what Depeche points out many times, a couple of times, really subtly in that, in the book, there's a decentering of humanity away even from whiteness to a decentering of humanity to us as a as global intersections and our first staff meeting of the year george and i we, we, okay bearing that in mind seeing that in the anthropocene in this new era what's our institutional responsibility as teachers and at mcgee or can we just ignore that do we just carry on business as usual and and in fact, it was our first collaboration time, right, George? We put up, there was the slide of the world. Um, and I said, you know, as teacher colleagues, in terms of collaboration, I'm throwing this out because we don't have the language to deal with it. And how, how do we do that as an institution? And how do we, is it sufficient just to recycle our pop cans uh, and have a, a vegetable garden in front of the school? That's sustainability. Is that, what is, what's going on here? And is there some thinking around how we structure knowledge um, that needs to change? Um, Andrew, even right down to challenging ourselves to think about who we do business with our financial institutions and which ones are um, involved in, in unethical, so to speak, um, practices, financing projects around the planet that are not ethical, um, that are not good for the actual planet, that are not good for people. And it was out there. And I think, not that we caught people off guard, but we did catch them off guard because it really made us reflect and go, wow, there are so many things out there that uh, day to day that don't, we don't even think about that impact everything on this globe. And, and taking your point a step further, Bank of Montreal statements arrived for McGee Secondary. And our banking is through the Bank of Montreal, and they're the second largest contributor uh, to global um, supporting industry and businesses that are um, important in terms of CO2 emissions. Uh, they're one of the, they're Canada's second largest investor in businesses that are involved in that and in those industries uh, and so our schools accounts are part of that and so is every other secondary school in Vancouver um, and that's a thought which I'm maybe at some point we need to to look at as within within our school and and raising that with our colleagues in, in different parts of the system uh, I know within VASA and within the VSTA neither of us uh, organizations and the BCTF none of us bank with with those corporate those financial institutions and so we're okay there but as a as another organization we might want to explore that our relationship and responsibilities there um 
one other cautionary tale is much, much earlier. Um, one of our readings was uh, Ralph Trulio's um, work, um, and I'm not wanting to repeat it, um, in his chapter three, which we looked at on the Haitian Revolution, um, when it occurred uh, across 12 years, um, back in the 1800s, early 1800s, Europe had no way to understand and conceptualize that revolution. And when the dispatches came from Haiti back to France, uh, the new French assembly, the revolutionary assembly during the French Revolution, they couldn't understand what was going on there because this wasn't supposed to be capable. Black people weren't supposed to be capable of this. Uh, and so it was a cognitive dissonance that uh, from the messages and the dispatches that were coming in that couldn't be understood within the frameworks of, of racist Europe at the time. And now we're in a similar situation as, as George and I were discussing with our teacher colleagues at our very first collaboration session, is that we don't have the language. Um, and Chakraborty consistently argues we need to decenter our thinking from those key precepts of the enlightenment that engineers are in this box and social planners are in another and us teachers and educators are in another box. Um, and but we don't have the language or thought process to this. For example, page 149, Depeche says, can we learn to look at the human world from non-human points of view? And as educators, we try doing that. And I've seen our colleagues and our teacher colleagues trying to do that. Um, is it sufficient to only do that within social studies and English? And, and I've seen some of our excellent science and math teachers trying to decenter and look at the human world from non-human points of view. And, and those might be really understandings of physics and chemistry and biology could be part of that. But we're still also talking about it from within a predominantly Western paradigms. Um, George, Alpha, um, Marilia, any colleagues, any thoughts from your practices and your positions around the rich complexity of, of where we're at and the possibilities of that, um, your experience? Or even Jennifer, do you have any, any thoughts, your readings of the Anthropocene, the complexity of the challenges and, and how we can do it from the local? You already, we're doing that. We are doing that decentering, I think. Um, does, how much does climate justice really come up within the city planning um, and as a, as, a, as a foundational thing? It's, not, it's never discussed in our meetings really within the district, down at the district. We talk about a new FIT program and other things, but we've never really discussed this piece. Um, it seems to be a bit of a vacuum, certainly within the principals meetings and, and vice principals meetings that we meet once a month. It's never really come up. I've tried, but um, we're generally focusing on the more mundane and immediate issues without a long-term vision. And they're very important to look at because we do share this planet with other species and we're all interdependent on each other. And um, it is something I think um, we overlook consistently and we don't look at it from the perspective of a, a, it goes beyond humans. Not that humans aren't important. Of course, humans are super important, but uh, there are millions of species of other creatures out there that we often just don't take into account. Yeah, and and then and and we, yeah, and we, we exactly wearing our jack boots. We we just trample over everything, yep. um, with mind, mindlessly, um, without having any understanding. And and that's what we really have to decenter, is is around that. Um, Jennifer, you did did you? you yeah, you I think yeah. Um, you're. There's so much like um, richness in what you're saying because um, I mean. I think when it comes to like education and curricular course content, um, our selection of curricular materials can really be conditioned or biased, of course, by our worldview. Um, and some of the work I was doing with SFU was around actually doing a, a rigorous review of whose knowledges are we centering in the readings that we cite, the yep. YouTube videos that we use. Um, 
And actually, there's so much more in Indigenous worldviews that speak to, I think, what you're getting at, which is how do we decenter mm-hmm. humans and understand the relationships between um, people and our surrounding environments that don't separate the two. Um, my, my master's uh, research was actually on climate adaptation and mitigation policy through the view of Indigenous knowledges and how much more we can actually understand when we decenter sort of humans in the conversation. Um, but it was through Indigenous knowledges that we can actually influence policy change if policies um, weren't measured only on Western knowledge base or Western Eurocentric knowledge base of what is uh, climate change, how do we measure climate change when certain Indigenous communities um, continue to have very close relationships with their environments, um, uh, the the livelihoods that um, depend on the environment. So I I would love to have like a whole different conversation about that. Um, But what you say is so important and I think it shows up in our classrooms and we have kids from all over the world who have such rich knowledge bases and worldviews that are more plural, I think, um, than some of the resources that we see used uh, on a daily yeah. basis. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. And um, uh, well, uh, Elizabeth uh, made a great point. Uh, it goes to the intersectionality of it all, the financial system and everything. Um, Elizabeth, I hope you don't mind I read it out. Uh, She says, I really appreciate the comment made about banks and where they invest in businesses with positive or negative influences on our planet and with or without global sustainability in mind. As a working parent with much privilege, I know that I need to do better in keeping aware of these perspectives. So thank you. I'm still spinning on that one. And she perfectly combined how we're looking at the planet and our financial dare I say needs or our finance, uh, like our financial system, let's say that, because it all ties in together. It's like, mm-hmm. you can't separate it. It really, really is all interlocked. Um, yeah. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. That was a perfect comment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm worried about Jennifer leaving, um, but uh, just one th- coming back to Jennifer's point about curriculum uh, and an advertisement and plug for next session. Um, one of the resources is a fascinating um, discussion between Jan Hare from UBC, um, Seth Klein, and Nomi um, Klein, uh, exactly around curriculum and, and education, secondary and elementary focus. So I think that could be a fascinating uh, segue, um, Jennifer, from what you just said. Um, another piece that uh, Depeche's argument is the global has really focused on 100 years, 200 year time frameworks, or my life, 70 years, 60 years, uh, quite sh- relatively short time frameworks. And with the planetary, we have to thought, think in thousands and as hundreds of thousands and millennia. And we have to be able to keep our mind transitioning between the relationships and the long term history and consequences of our actions. Um, which comes to another part of your convers- your point just now, Jennifer, about uh, the seventh generation uh, and in indigenous thinking and philosophy, we think through the consequences of through to the seventh generation. And that's exactly what Depeche is speaking about and decentering from the short time frame works of um, predominantly Western thinking to those long duree of, of, of the planetary uh, and our relationship which comes back to the importance of local action, uh, which started the conversation, Jennifer, with your reflections on the city. Uh, and, and now Elizabeth has just mentioned, and I love that phrase, I'm spinning on that, um, because of yeah, of the banking and of our relationships. And, uh, and just if, if all the schools, the Vancouver schools who are, are within, I don't know what the contract with BMO was and how much was saved from that uh, contract, a couple of million, whatever, that's all good. Uh, that's very important, but maybe that's coming up for renewal, and maybe this can be part of a conversation. And and who knows? It's something that I know that many of us would support within the schools. So what we just want to talk about a little bit next would be, um, and we've alluded to some of this, is ways out. And and is there any way out of of the um, centered 
Enlightenment European paradigm, which structures our philosophy, structures our organizations and institutions. And I think we've already pointed out and alluded to the fact that, yeah, there's many. Um, and um, being mindful of the banking practices, recycling, doing all of those things, we, we're doing as much of that as we can, sometimes more so, sometimes less. I've been driving every day to work. I live very close to school. I shouldn't be doing that. But, you know, there, so there's many, many things we can do. But um, one of the things which comes out of the different readings that we've done um, is the decentering of human centric thinking um, and moving away from it's all about me. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the individualism, uh, which is a huge part of, of our economic systems, the economic rationality, the invisible hand of the market, all of that stuff, which is so important to the way we've structured our social and economic systems. So this is Dupesh Chakraborty's position and the decentering of human centric thinking. And, and I try to think of that uh, when I'm looking at the school and trying to move as the principle to above the mundane, the individual, the importance of the individual and the mundane, because that's key. Um, but then also having to shift to, to um, the bigger systems around us. And another part, way of explaining the same concept, I think, is, is the relation of care. And that, I'm not sure if, George, you might have read Mal Noddings back during our master's days. Um, Marilia, Roberto, the rest of your colleagues, uh, if you did a, your master's, you might have read Mal Noddings' work on the relation of care. It was a British guy writing, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and maybe even 2000, early 2000 period. Um, and then another way of putting it is, is celebrating the festival of the imagination. Um, and in our last reading group session, um, we, we looked a little bit about this uh, with Mbembe and Necropolity. Uh, other notions of radical decolonization, and then also the notion of resurgence uh, um, that is starting to creep into the dialogue here uh, that Glenn Coltard spoke about in session three. Um, and so I just want to spend a few seconds going over some of that, because I think when people feel overwhelmed and we wonder if there's anything and if there's any point to it all, um, I think that there is a point to it, um, and um, this, this keeps us moving. Um, Alpha as well, your thinking from your perspective and your position coming from Uganda, your family back home there, um, and the difficulty sometimes there within, um, yeah, the post-colonial, the neo-colonial thinking, I see it in South Africa, um, and I think your current prime minister and parliament um, Sometimes it, it's interesting how things work from a resurgence decolonization perspective. So chip in whenever you feel like. Um, just looking at uh, Akil Mbembi, what some of this means would be that whenever others, or more specifically my neighbor or my fellow human, no longer reveal me to myself, and when, whenever I render myself unable to encounter the other's face, unable to be here with other human beings, with my fellow beings, illnesses nearby. And that comment strikes me when I think about uh, witnessing in the downtown um, and how the cleaning, the clearing occurred. Because on the Monday when uh, the, the police and, and cleaning guys moved in, um, and I, my daughter phoned me from Halifax saying, Dad, have you seen what's going on downtown? And Maya used to work in Vandu as well with, with Vince. Um, I didn't know. And it's in my own city and I didn't know what was going on. So I hopped on a bus and, and went down and then uh, later on met up with Alpha on that day. Um, but I got down early enough to be able to witness some of what was going on uh, and then connect up with Alpha and my wife, Suzanne. And we spoke a little bit about it, but, but um, how easy it is for us um, and for our fellow human beings um, to become invisible uh, and for us to be desensitized to the other person's face. And then also to judge the other person's face and experience without really understanding what brings them to those places. Um, and I think in terms of decentering whiteness, it's being mindful of that and then being aware of the relation of care. 
uh, and that we need to listen, as Jennifer was saying, and, and with, a, with a yes mindset. Um, another example of decentering whiteness would be those, uh, another point here that Mbembe suggests, every authentic act of caring presumes the reconstitution of that link um, between people and therefore of something that is common to us, our common humanity. Uh, the reconstitution of the human, of the common, begins with an exchange of speech and a breaking of silence. Um, and uh, there I'm, st I'm struck again thinking uh, about our history in South Africa and Alpha, your experience, your witnessing in, from Uganda, um, and how important it is to break the silence. Um, I see that in, in the Ukraine war at the moment and how um, mindful and careful and important it is to not be quiet when we see atrocities that are being committed uh, and calling them out. Um, but even within that, there's, it's, it's, it's occurring and we say, oh, it's a war situation. Um, but we have to break those silences. Um, there is, we need that exchange of speech. Alpha, do you have any any thinking there? Um, from one hundred percent. I uh, when I'm thinking about even as people look at Uganda today, you know, there's you know the you know some of the laws that have come in, and when we stop thinking about others and how difficult, then an illness is nearby, and uh, I talk about that because we have a saying. Um, you know, we have some laws, you can do some research on that. I don't know how much I can say on here, but uh, Uganda has put in some new laws that are uh, discriminating, you know, towards different mm -hmm. folks. And, uh, and that forgetting or not thinking about others, the illness is much greater than the potential short-term, quote unquote, whatever they may call success, right? And it's very crucial that as a people, we continuously wake up thinking, how are we doing, not instead of how am I living alone? And uh, because we're gonna struggle. And I, and I see that, um, <laughs> and I, I get so concerned because, um, you know, looking on the east side of Vancouver, I was, the way it all began, I was driving into the city because I go through you know, the part of town when I'm thinking about giving back to the community because of my work, it would uh, help change my city, my organization. I always drive through the community and my heart, you know, I think about ways in which I can ignite giving in the lives of, you know, students and, and corporations in around us. How can we, you know, make a difference in the lives of the people around us? And uh, I think that it's very crucial that we become intentional in the way that we're living. It's good for us to make some money or chase our goals and dreams, but how are our friends living continuously? Otherwise, the illness, as it says, the illness is nearby, or are we already ill? That's the question, right? And uh, that's, what, that's it, that's what I was thinking about. I'm very much impacted by, um, by by what happened on the east side because we spend our time going to the east side to help you know the the young people. Some of the young people that I've worked with are down there. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they are right now. You know, I usually get in my car and I and I go down there and I have either lunch with them or you know my birthday. I sit down with one of the gentlemen that's been homeless for a while and I I find him and I sit down with him every birthday. It's coming up in less than 10 days. I don't know where to find them. Like, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it really impacts us in a huge way. When we stop thinking about others, we literally die. Because when we think about it on, on a different level, we are the others. And if nobody's thinking about us, how then are we going to survive? Right? That's it. Yeah, and your your point, your words, your phrase there, are we already ill? And yes, we are. And, I, you know, I might think that I'm not, but yes, I am absolutely spiritually very, very ill because it's reflected in what's going on around us. And, and what are we responsible for? And, well, you know, I can get the letters going to the mayor. I can sign a letter to the mayor. 
um, and we can reach out to different people within our organizations and communities. Um, and, and that's the only thing we can do. Another example, which we've really part of here is the opiate crisis. Um, and I heard on, maybe it was Monday, the former uh, chief medical officer for the province who declared the opioid crisis as a public health emergency. Um, he just threw out this number that in the first three months of this year, just shy of 600 people died from over, overdoses. And I, as I'm driving to school, I'm doing the numbers and I can't quite believe the numbers. Um, in three months, you can have six, 600 people dying from overdoses in the province and 200 people dying in one month. Um, and the great majority of those are here in our community. And these are not, these are, these are friends of ours, family of ours, every one of us, I'm sure in this group knows at least two or three people who have passed away in our family circles uh, and in our extended family networks. Um, and that, that number is a, is a symptom and is an example of, um, of, of the illness that, that is in our society. That is, you know, it's not working out all that well for uh, European rationality and Eurocentric thinking. Um, had a fascinating conversation with her friend uh, the other night, um, and she was insisting on Western rationality and the importance of the scientific method, uh, and and that that is what we 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 start and end on. Um, and uh, you know, my my response is well, it's not really working out all that well for us, is it? Because I mean, by some predictions, we've got ten, fifteen, a hundred years um, if we read some of the climate the, the reports of the United Nations um, Committee on Climate Change. So, it's, yeah, I think recognizing that we are ill as a society and that it has personal impacts um, in spite of our privilege, which shield us, that's, that's part of decentering whiteness. Um, I want to touch a little bit on the radical decolonization. Um, and this comes from uh, Akikil Mbembe from the first session. Um, and this touches base, uh, reiterates, I think, some of the earlier points. Um, radical decolonization includes allowing oneself to be affected by others, which comes to your point, right, Alpha, um, or to be defenselessly exposed to another existence, uh, constitutes the first step towards that form of recognition that will not be constituted in the master-slave paradigm. Master-slave paradigm, a, a fundamental part of plat platonic thinking, uh, and then, of course, developed by Hegel and then Marx and all of those guys, right, uh, which filters through into policies and banks and, and institutions in the dialectic of powerlessness and omnipotence um, uh, or in that combat victory and that of combat victory and defeat, um, which is reinforced through sport, through our daily existence, daily experience. Um, on the contrary, the kind of relation that arises from it is a, a relation of care. So recognizing and accepting vulnerability, or even admitting that it, that to live is always to live exposed, including to death, is the point of departure of every ethical elaboration whose aim in the last instance is humanity. And I, a lovely, a beautiful summary of what I think um, decentering whiteness entails. And what I think when we start getting trying to get specific then this translates into policy in my school of how i work with colleagues in my school and my practice and i can only speak for that um and if i'm transparent about that as who i'm at, i am and what i'm all about then if i don't live up to that then colleagues like alpha and george can say andrew you're failing here uh, and and can deflate my bubble um so, so I think this does impact on classroom practice um, and our transparency of our political positions and our moral positions. And that's, that's speaking for myself. If people feel comfortable about that, um, then, then work with me on this. And otherwise, well, um, that's, that's my positionality that's been stated. Um, Colleagues, any of you out there have any thoughts? Uh, I think a, a central part of that is the ethic of care, which teachers generally just have and bring to the table. That's why we go into this profession. Um, and then um, Liz, uh, as a parent, you know, that's, I think if you want to 
understand as teachers within the system, most of us, I believe, when we go into teacher education is because we're coming from that positionality of care. Uh, I think also within the medical profession, our nurses and doctor colleagues, they go into it because that's that ethic of care is so important to their lives. Um, and every moment in a hospital or in a school, we should be accepting our vulnerability and living a life exposed. Um, and I think those are some of the best teachers that recognize that uh, and are able to work with that. Um, um, what I'm hoping for, um, this slide is when we're moving on to, to talk about some of the other readings. Um, Leanne Simpson's book, Dancing on Turtles Back and the Mindful of the Time. Um, if you, it's a short read, but it's a beautiful, uh, passionately written, phenomenal, phenomenal book. Uh, Leanne Simpson is Ojibwe, um, and a lot of that book speaks about uh, Ojibwe perspectives and, and takes Ojibwe words and language um, and shows how that frames the thinking uh, towards a, a ethic of care and relationality and intergenerationality. Um, and uh, Leanne is a colleague of Glenn's who we mentioned earlier on from session three. Um, and I think maybe if we do this next year, we would, I'll, I'll reach out to Leanne and ask if she wouldn't mind being a, a facilitator with us. Um, but if you do have time to read her book, it's available from most bookstores around, um, something like 13 or $14. It's a phenomenal um, read, but it, it's, it does take, I, it's taken me three or four times to read because it's so rich. Uh, she also uses a narrative style um, of a storytelling narrative. Um, a, her pedagogy, her teaching is through storytelling and weaving that into um, a broader position from the local to the global and the planetary. Um, and so that's, that's another, if people are looking for something practical, um, I thought I would put out Leanne's work. And then um, this going back with Glenn and the interconnections of, of place and relationships, locale and locality. I'm not sure if it's possible um, for people to watch um, this interview with Glenn from Decinta um, that helps to, I think, take forward our conversation about radical decolonization um, from an indigenous DNA perspective. Uh, and De Glenn is being interviewed up on, on Dene land um, at the Decinta Education Center that he started. Um, and he's speaking about some of the aspects of curriculum and pedagogy that um, that we're going to be talking about also next week. I mean, next session, um, and that Jennifer raised and mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, I'm wondering about our time. It's 5.16, so I don't think it's worthwhile breaking and watching that and coming back to it. Um, I think if you don't mind um, and just taking down the link, uh, Roberta, Heather, Elizabeth, and Marilia, um, take down the reference uh, or look it up uh, if you can. And um, I think you'll find it very, really fascinating uh, if you're looking for a very practical experience and example, um, which is different to what I was citing about what we try to do here at McGee. Um, we did, at this point, what I'm trying to do is, is throw out a, a range of different examples of decentering whiteness and the practical aspects to that um, within the local settings, um, which have a vision towards the planetary and the long term. Um, and the Black Lives Matter movement that um, was founded in the United States that emerged and, and Olive was one of the um, main thinkers and leaders in the emergence of BLM. Um, uh, which quickly, as you know, moved into a, a global movement um, and is now taking a different shape and a different form. Um, what she's, the, in an interview she gave, um, she's speaking about the overvalued punishment um, and the apparatus that criminalize our communities. And part of moving beyond that uh, and the punishment paradigm is that what Jennifer referred to as the getting to yes paradigm. Um, and that we can actually find different ways of relating to people. Well, absolutely, I've worked in prisons myself as doing some teaching in them. I, there are people that 
that we don't want to have walking the general um, community. There are also other people that we know um, through a film, if you watch that one of our films which we referred to earlier on, uh, the 13th Amendment, the 13th, um, I think session two, um, there is a, a preponderance of incarceration of indigenous and black people in our community. Um, and there are various consequences and causes for that. Um, and all of, I think, um, and we even within the VSB, um, we're trying to go along and be mindful and be aware of, of how that works in policy and disciplinary frameworks. Um, here within the VSB, the debate was really structured around police presence in schools uh, and the presence of police liaison officers within schools um, and how that would shape our thinking um, and how important it was for us to engage with um, colleagues in the VPD um, so that there are different ways of interaction, interacting um, with members of the community. Um, but I think there's a point there again of that Oliver is mentioning from her perspective um, as a black woman and a black activist and a black community builder, builder um, on looking more to resources for education and mental health and so on and so on and so on, um, which is precisely what is needed in the streets of the downtown. Um, and and um, rather than the quick approach of, of the bulldozer. Lastly, I'm, I just want to come back to Billy Ray Belcourt um, and his work. And another part to, to all of this is the decentering of heteronormativity. And I think this is where somewhere that we are moving in some directions. But a throwback to Alpha's position and, and comments about uh, Uganda and the recent laws and changes in the laws um, and the extremely conservative um, laws that have just been passed. Um, and certainly, well, in Uganda and also in Florida and parts of the United States, um, we can see that this, this battle is, is a huge one. And then, of course, in the downtown east side and the disappearing wo disappeared woman, um, how much a part of that is related to masculinities uh, and definitions of masculinity that are ce celebrated all over our society. Every time um, we turn on a TV, it's being celebrated. Um, and that decentering of the of heteronormative video is, is part of it. Uh, Akil and Bembi points out um, in the contemporary neoliberal order, it claims to have gone beyond the racial the struggle for it. Racial justice must take new forms. Uh, we need to connect to in entirely new ways the project of non-racialism to that of human mutuality. In the last instance, non-racialism is about more than mere recognition. It's about radical sharing and, and universal inclusion. Um, which, which I think part of the Black Lives Matter movement is, is an example of um, finding very different forms and ways of struggling to decenter whiteness. Um, and, and part of that would be a festival of the Af imagination. Part of that extending is Afrofuturism, different futurisms, pick your passion. Um, the video that is linked up to the session um, on a mantler from South Africa is showing the role of music um, in the liberation struggle in, in my country um, and how within the African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress, the two main liberation movements, how that was seen as a fundamental part of the liberation struggle. Um, and what the white minority government didn't understand was um, how controlling the cultural terrain um, was the white government was just t adopting the um, sledgehammer approach to fighting the liberation war and that was just going in with guns and boots um, and the Africanist perspective within the liberation struggle was using a much broader strategy uh, and was deploying culture as a part of the liberation struggle was deploying ancestor and the ancestral worship and understandings of that in the liberation struggle. So it was much, much more rich and, and multifaceted. Uh, and so if you want to look at part of that um, within my country, that the film Amandla does an excellent job in showing the importance of music and the linking of music to spiritualism uh, and then liberation um, within the South African context. So that um, when, when we look at decentering whiteness in this session, uh, from the local to the global um, and then to the planetary. Um, 
what George and I, um, and then thanks Alpha for being here and Jennifer in your absence. What we're trying to point out here is that it's not lost. It's part of being creative. It's part of being human uh, and being together and working together is the only way we can decenter uh, the Eurocentric. And that brings us to the end of today. And it's 5.23. I'm mindful of your time. Amazing that people are still here. Um, does anyone want to have any comments? Um, I can't monitor the chat. I'm going to try to. Um, okay, there. I'm just quickly monitoring the chat. Um, Elizabeth, to everyone, curricula, I wonder if the struggle of decentering whiteness is so more significant in the old resource that we have access to and how we teach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in the tech conversation, that's a fascinating point um, is that you raise around uh, the tech area um, and artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, I think it's a fascinating point that you bring in there. Um, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here and for joining us. And thanks so much for your time. And we really look forward to our last session. Uh, and uh, we'll be finalizing a keynote speaker. There are various folks who I've thought of and I've reached out to, um, but we'll confirm and then we'll put it out there. In the meantime, if you do have time, uh, watch the interview um, that Jan Hare facilitates as part of a conversation. Um, and then we will, um, we will connect up for our final session.